Does Blank Hold Up is a soft spin-off show where I get to talk about 90s movies again like I used to. If you missed the Ronin episode, the question is of course rhetorical. Of course The Matrix holds up as well as other 90s pumped up kicks I'm covering on this show. And The Matrix is a lot of things to a lot of people. What is endlessly fascinating to me is how the 20 year life of this film deepens and grows over time. I can't say that about a lot of movies, but this film is literally about more things than it was clear that it was in 1999. Does steak taste different if you know it's not real? When I saw this when I was 17, I think I would have said that it didn't matter. Probably also when I was a 17 year old boy, I just really wanted steak all the time. I see it differently now. There's a mountain of intent here that I wouldn't have noticed when I was younger. If you look at Lana and Lily Wachowski's entire filmography as a whole, it gives you valuable perspective on their messages of acceptance, joy, love, transformations, and space bees. The Matrix is about waking up for the first time as your true self. And then all these boring assholes and suits just keep trying to dead name you all the time. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. My name is Neo. The Matrix, 20 years later. In 1994, Warner Brothers was presented with a script for the film Assassins, yeah, the Banderas one, that they liked so much they wanted two more movies out of those screenwriters. Joel Silver, producer of Die Hard, Predator, Lethal Weapon 13, Ghosts, Exit Wounds, and Veronica Friggin' Mars, to name a select few in an effort to illustrate how wide the gamut tangos, operated as producer on Assassins in the first Wachowski-directed film, Bound. A film that deserves more attention than it gets because it is a big gay heist movie the producers, remember this is 1996, were pretty keen to make if they changed the main character into a man. It's perfect. So the film would be more of a straight romance because hey, 90s America wanted everyone to know how straight it was even if that was a filthy lie. You know, in lieu of a lesbian noir film. Which we got and it was great. Lana and Lily told the producers to, uh, cram it. Bound made its budget back and punctuated the fact that this duo could direct art house moneymakers and make no mistake. Lily and Lana never left the art house in the pursuit of big budget movies. Not the beast! Their second film was to be The Matrix. This was going to be a $60 million movie, so they needed some star power. Neo was being pitched to Will Smith, a part he passed on to play. Hang on, I wrote this down. Jim West in Wild Wild West. Wow. Reteaming with Men in Black director Barry Sonnenfeld, so it actually makes perfect sense he would make that decision, but whatever. Our good friend Morpheus was to be played by none other than Val Kilmer. $60 $60 million was a lot of money to a studio at the time, so they got two, splitting the production cost between the studios, Warner Brothers, and Village Roadshow. It would shoot in Australia. They cast Keanu Reeves, Carrie Ann Moss, and Lawrence Fishburne. There was a lot of philosophy and technology being discussed with the making of this movie, so the cast was asked to read light material like Jean Baudrillard's Simulacra and Simulation. A book about how media warps our reality because what even is real? See a subtle if you cross your eyes, just right. They hired legendary fight choreographer Yuan Wu Ping, known for choreographing, yeah, all of these movies, to give a distinctly Western film a distinctly Eastern feel. Everyone would train for months ahead of time because this film was going to be exceptionally hard to make. This was a terrifying film to undergo because it required the actors to do an exceptional amount of training ahead of time because The Matrix was going to be an exceptional movie. 
It also is worth noting sort of on the side here how much of a badass Keanu Reeves is. In training before pre-production, he suffered a two-level fusion of his cervical spine. He fused three of his vertebrae bad enough that he was experiencing a noticeable amount of leg paralysis. So like, not a small thing. It required neck surgery right before and an uncomfortable distance from actual production. Generally, in an action movie, you don't want your central actor to be experiencing really any amount of paralysis. The Wachowskis did their best and gave him a light training schedule, but Kiana was like, Ah, come on, what's a little neck fusion? <laughs> oh, hey. What did you know? Keanu kicks less than everyone else in this movie for that reason, because his vertebrae had been so recently fused it messed up his legs. So the choreography had to work his arms twice as hard. I've said it before, but it bears repeating, Keanu Reeves is the hardest working dude in show business. I haven't even mentioned that John Gata made that whole bullet time thing happen, just revolutionized film special effects by firing a bunch of DSLRs off a fraction of a second apart in a long cascade. Put two film cameras on either side of that cascade and you can pass between them in really cool ways. No big, just a huge technological breakthrough pushing the end of the practical filmmaking era to its crescendo. For as much of a CGI era that this also ushered in, long story short-ish, the film cost 65-ish million and returned almost half a billion, all the while changing the literal landscape with which action movies are made. If you want to talk about home run metaphors, that one landed in the back of a pickup truck minding its own business on the road next to the stadium. This movie was also marketed on obscuring what the movie was about under the guise that no one can be told what The Matrix is. Yes, The Matrix holds up. Bye! <laughs> I think it holds up better than practically any other film made in the 90s. I mean that as both an action movie that absolutely changed what was expected from an action movie, but I also mean that as an allegory for things far deeper that can inform us of our own collective humanity. More on the latter in a moment. This entire movie escalates the stakes like a rocket through Acts 1 and 2. Neo is told he might be special, then he isn't, then he is, then he isn't. I mean, learning you're a battery would have adverse effects on one's state of calm, surely. But he doesn't really care. He and Trinity decide that they're going to do the thing that everyone told them not to do to save their friend. It's a simple setup, really. Just save Morpheus, that's it. It's such a cool redirect because at this point we have been told repeatedly and so have Neo and Trinity that he is not the one. Please remove any metallic items you're carrying, keys, loose change. We've seen repeatedly that you cannot win in a fight this big. Which is why the lobby shootout is so brilliant. It's a majestic ballet of action cinema that no one had really shown us before. It's bombastic, but it's also beautiful. Then Neo has to fight an agent, which he does. Eh, okay, but Trin is the real star here. Dodge this. As action climaxes go, the lobby shootout, to the elevator, to the rooftop scene, to the helicopter escape, to the subway station, to the foot chase, to the moment Neo gets it, where he literally sees through the Matrix. Hey Mikey, I think he likes it. That's a hell of a run in a single movie. Filmmakers spend their whole lives trying to string even half of the majesty of this ending together. The Wachowskis did it in their second movie. In fact, The Matrix changed the way we look at movies, it launched the Keanozons. Now give me the Carianozons. The Matrix movies have always been about something more. A lingering perception, the thing we cannot name, but we know is there. There is philosophy coursing through its veins like a freight train. It is a movie about freedom and equality in the face of tyranny. 
If the system is unfair, you do not only fight your enemies, you fight the system itself. I mean, the movie ends with a track called Wake Up from Rage Against the Machine, a notoriously apolitical band who definitely doesn't rage against injustices in our actual world. It says in the script, do a sarcastic cough, and it was also a super personal film. Thought, um, you were a guy. Most guys do. The Matrix cannot tell you who you are. We're afraid. You're afraid of us. Afraid of change. There are a lot of things to take away from The Matrix. You can read allegory as anything from a prison of our own creation to religion. There's a lot of talk about Plato's allegory of the cave in relation to this movie, in which prisoners are chained to a wall from birth, and the unchained choose to paint a reality for them by holding cutouts in front of the fire to create shadows on the wall, a layer of control over reality. To the prisoners in the cave, this is reality. The shadows are to be feared, to be loved, but the reality is there is no spoon. If the prisoners were simply unchained, they could see the shadows are reflections of those that continue to imprison them. The more you can inform yourself, the more powerful you are. We're all chained inside the cave in one way or another. The intent of the art is in the very fabric of this movie. Watch it again. This is a film written and directed by two transgender women. No one can be told what the Matrix is. I can only show you the door. You have to walk through it. The Matrix as trans struggle allegory is not a rare interpretation, especially in the transgender community. Many Better than I have talked about this at length. Vox talked about it, the Mary Sue talked about it, the Huffington Post talked about it. Neo is restless, urgent for a different life than the one he has. Everyone tells Neo who he is. The world tells him he has to live within the confines that the powers that be have set up to control humanity. He doesn't use his given name and has an entirely different identity online. This is not subtle. Then he wakes up in the real world, realizing that the shadows dancing on the wall were merely another system of control. He then fully adapts that identity and begins to believe in himself. Where do we find the courage to break free of the boxes of our lives? This interpretation is vital because if the Matrix is about anything, which it certainly is, at its most basic level, it's about being who you truly are when the world tells you no because the world is wrong. There is no spoon. Where do we find the courage to break free of the boxes of our lives, to transcend and overcome tragedy, the monsters within, and the violence we do to ourselves when we are too afraid to be who we really are? There's a critical eye being cast back on Lana's and my work through the lens of our transness. This is a cool thing because uh, it's an excellent reminder that art is never static. Uh, and while the ideas of identity and transformation are critical components in our work, the bedrock that all ideas rest upon is love. 